Hello and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. How are you today? Do you have a patriot in the family? Patriots are like all the rage now, right? What do you, can you get back to the American Revolutionary War? Well, let me just tell you, early in my genealogy career, early 2000s, I had no story about any patriots or anything. What I knew was D.A.R. Library, the Daughters of the American Revolutionary Library. If you have not been there, it is a genealogist dream. It's one of those places where you can go to and all you have to do is find your state and find your county. And you could basically sit in the aisle and just look at all the books. It's like really beautiful because the DAR does all these projects. All of their different groups do projects. And let me tell you why I was there. I was there because of this. I went to attend. It was this big event where they, they pulled out this book and they gave these to us part of our registration. African-American and American Indian Patriots of the American Revolutionary War. Often I hear during the 4th of July, African-Americans might say, you know, 4th of July, we didn't have any choices. That wasn't for us. Guess what? This book right here says something different. People had choices. African-Americans made choices, whether they were patriots or whether they were rebels or whether they decided to leave this join with the British, African-Americans made choices, okay? Let's remember that. Let's remember that. So today we have an amazing show. Um, I Before I get ready on the show, because you know, once I start on the genealogy, I forget. I forget that I want to know who you are. Quick starters, we are so happy to have you here because we don't have genealogy quick start without you. So make sure in the chat, you tell us, where you're from. And if you have a genealogy group, definitely, definitely let us know because there's always some genealogy souls looking for a genealogy group. If you are not in a genealogy group, that's your homework assignment. Find a genealogy group and hang out with them because that's how you can really know what's going on. And um, I'm in a couple of them. I never announced my own genealogy group. So let me tell you about my genealogy groups. I am my first genealogy group. My cousin Floyd took me to the African-American genealogy group in Philly. And we have another one AAGG person here today that I'm going to introduce some of you to. A lot of you probably know her. And I'm also a member of the Genealogical Society of, the, of Pennsylvania. And there's always some amazing stuff going on at both groups. So definitely check out their websites. And um, I do have one other book because I showed you about these patriots, right? There was this amazing lady who was the primary speaker or kind of like the, uh, I don't know, she kind of ran the program. Her name is Deborah Newman or Deborah Newman Ham, but she has another book that everyone should have in their collection. It's one of my favorite books. Like if I, if I was, if my house was burning and I could only grab a couple books, this book I would grab. It's Black History, A Guide to Civilian Records at the National Archives by Deborah L. Newman. And you can see I definitely get some use out of it. But you might not know about a patriot, but you know about civilians in America who were Black. <laughs> so you can use this book to go a lot deeper into the National Archives than the general stuff like military stuff, census stuff, Freedmen's Bureau. There is a whole lot going on there. All right. So that was the books for the show today. But let me just tell you who we have and what we're going to talk about. Today, we have two new quick starts for you. And the first one is going to be about passenger lists. We always want to know about passenger lists. There's always different little tips and different ways to go about it. But Jim and Michael have some interesting search techniques that you're going to use for online searching of all of these various passenger lists. So they're not only going to tell you where they are and they're going to tell you how to search them. And then our extra special guest, Joyce Mosley from the African American Genealogy Group in Philadelphia. And she is a, um, she is um, submitted and she is a member of the DAR. And she's going to talk to you about her Black Patriot 
Joyce is one of those folks in Philly who are related to a lot of famous people. And she's going to talk to you about one of them today. So first, let me bring on my number one buddies. Oh, did I tell you, show you the titles? I have great titles for today. The titles are... The quick starts are search strategies for online passenger list and breaking a revolutionary bread. So let's go ahead and bring on my buddies. First up, columnist and editor, Jim Beidler. How you doing, Jim? How you doing? I am well, and you, Jamel? I'm doing good. You should have seen Jim scarfing down some Dairy Queen. Like he had sound effects. He was scraping the sides. Me and Michael, we're going to have a little chat with Jim. After this, show. oh, he still you still have more. No, oh, it's, it's done. It's done. <laughs> don't I don't want to hear any scraping or slurping. Just kidding. Um, and next up, genealogy tip of the day, Michael John Neal. Hello, Michael. Hello. I think that was serving number two, but that's just uh... <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have any patriots in your family? I don't have any that I know of yet, but what about you guys, Mr. Oh, Pennsylvania, Mike. Pennsylvania? <laughs> Oh, come on now. I only have one couple who came over in the 1800s. All the rest of mine are colonial. So I think I have two or three dozen <laughs> patriots, you know, who who at least did a little bit of drill, a little bit of militia. Maybe maybe they weren't in any important battles, but they at, at least at least were doing something. Yes. Yeah. So you have a whole bunch like, OK. All right, so you 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 could just peel them off. Those are your revolutionary war soldiers. Uh, How about you, Michael? You on the flip any? side of that, three fourths of my people were not here before 1850, and I have three that um, gave what was termed patriotic service. Um, none that none that served that I know of. I don't think at least right now, but they gave patriotic service. To, as some of you know, as we're going to talk about in the second quick start. Um, patriotic service qualifies for DAR membership, even if they were not enlisted in a unit. Very cool. I love that. So you guys out there, quick starter, do you have any patriots in your family? We'd love to hear about them in the chat. Um, let's see, who do we have here? We have Kathy still in Ohio. Hey, Kathy, guess what? I think I'm coming to Ohio soon. Hi, June from Shaker Heights and Dr. Debbie's group AAG. S in Cleveland. How you guys doing out there? I miss you guys. Hey, Jean from Collegeville, PA, another AAGG, Philly here, and Augs, Philly. She's a genealogy junkie, everyone. And she has Augs, is that Greater Virginia and South Carolina Historical Society. Dean is here also from two African American genealogy groups in Philadelphia and Genealogy Society of Pennsylvania. Hey, and he's a patriot descendant too. Are you a patriot yeah. descendant too, Dean? Sure. Yes, sir. S A R. So, hello, Lori from Grand Haven, Michigan. How do you find a genealogy group? Wow, that is a great question. Google genealogy groups in the area that you're researching or near where you live. Because think about it, the A A G G in Philly. We're researching all over the country and we have state like most of them, a lot of them are doing Virginia. And so try to find a local group where you can go and sit with people. So your library might have one, your historical society, but just do a search for a genealogy group and put in your town, county. Yes, I love that question. Hey, Debbie from Texas. Gene friends in Plano libraries. Love that. Love that. Hi. Um, is it? Delise in Brampton, Ontario. Welcome. And oh, Kathy says Facebook. Facebook is good. Yes. And local libraries. Find some people you can actually walk in and you can sit with them. Um, Valerie, Alabama. I miss Alabama so much. I could just cry. I miss Alabama. Um, and yes, Dean is uh, an SAR, a son of an American Revolutionary War patriot. That, that's compatriot Henry to you. <laughs> you are hysterical okay what is our quick start for today let's see it is search strategies for online passenger list online so we're focusing in our sweet spot online all right so you guys um i guess you don't have to really explain that much 
much, right? Oh, maybe you should, You did you want to explain time period that you're focusing on maybe? Because I know Joyce had some questions and you were like, um. The time period that we're going to be looking at is post-1820 because that when there was federal legislation that mandated the keeping of passenger lists. And from that point on, the content is a, is a little more consistent. Um, there was, you know, some bite in the fact they had to record these lists. And then as time progressed, um, especially when you get to the early 20th century, there's, a, there's significantly more data in those passenger lists because of legislation that was passed in the early in the early 20th century. And because these lists are more comprehensive after that point in time, and they've been microfilmed and digitized, those are the ones that we're going to be focusing on when we talk about online search strategies in this in this quick start. Fantastic. So we ready to get going? Zoom, so zoom. We're, we're, we're going to be no good on all of Jim's Germans that came super, super early and all that good stuff. We're going to be helpless on him. So just well, well, out. we're not going to we're not going to cover that. <laughs> but it is it is worth noting that those colonial Germans, there is the only large set of arrival records who for those who came through the port of Philadelphia. Uh, if you got Scots Irish who came over colonial times, eh. <laughs> uh, and that pretty much goes for uh, for everyone else. But the the Germans, since they were considered foreigners, that is, they weren't subject to the King of England. Pennsylvania decreed in 1727 that they had to keep keep these uh, turn in lists and uh, swear oaths of allegiance. Uh, males age 16 and older. So that that's, I mean, that's one of the more Good to key, be German. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. That's one of the more key uh, sources for the Pennsylvania Germans. But we're not going to talk about that. Today. But we're not talking about any of this. <laughs> All right. So let's get started with step one for search strategies for online passenger lists. So step one is to research immigrant in the area of settlement. Oh, my God. So you mean... I'm not going to go and search for them in a foreign country in a place that I don't know yet. Is that what you're saying? Not immediately. And don't even look for those passenger lists immediately. You've uh, for a ver one, you want to make sure you've got a rough idea of, of when they were born and when they emigrated, what their name actually was, what variants there might be for their name. If they came, uh, you know, did they come with, with family, either as a married couple with young children or a single and what have you, or with other family perhaps, but knowing as much about that family structure before you search passenger list can be helpful, whether the name is common or not, but the more common the name, the better off you are. If you know that the person had siblings or children or whatever coming over as well, that gives you other names to help look for on a list that could help you determine if it's your if it's your person or not because you may find a person that could be yours and then you might see you might look down on the list three or four names oh well that was somebody on his <laughs> baptismal when he had his kids baptized 30 years later or whatever if you've done all that work you've got those names and that that can help you sometimes yeah i violated this rule uh some years ago was helping my girlfriend research her the Croatian <laughs> grandparents, and uh, I I thought I had found a passenger list that they came over separately, which matched the family lore. Well, well long story short, is is we went to a Croatian village. Terry had a very emotional moment, you know, thinking this is where her grandparents came from. And then later, when she got the naturalization file for her grandfather, it turned out he was from a completely different part of Croatia. Ooh. Uh, so. Ooh. Can you show me the mark or the scar that you still have from that? <laughs> Terry was very gentle about it. So. He can, no, but he can show you the receipt for the flowers you bought. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. All right. So focus where you know. That's it, right? All right. Do, step do your two. homework. It goes back to doing your homework. Get Ameri every conceivable American record for the immigrant generation, including the children of the immigrant. Get your cluster straight. Know your peeps. Not just your peep, but your peeps. All right. Step two, estimate year of immigration. What are some tips on doing that? There, 
think there's a slide that talks about yeah. this actually if you want to pull if you can pull that up really quickly how finally you can estimate this depends upon when they came over and how long they lived in the united states before they died because the more recently they came over or the longer they lived the higher the chance they're in more records or records that requested or asked for more detailed information but census records let they're late enough they'll give you here we go um uh, later census records in the early 20th century will give you years if your person lived that long if they had family if they had children over there and over here look at when the children started being born in the u.s as opposed to to overseas that could give you a, bra a rough time frame if if they naturalized um they had to have been here probably seven years most likely um so that would give you a back if everything was done legally that would give you a backtrack for a a rough time period when they had to be here or if they filed a declaration of intention first they didn't have to be here as long to file that the death certificate perhaps might have asked how long they were in the state if they lived long enough to have a quote unquote good death certificate and anything else that might give you some <laughs> some you know you've, you've got to look and think about oh is this is there a clue here to when they came over sometimes they're in your face blatantly stated other times you have to use this thing called your um brain and you know, see is there are there some conclusions i can draw from that but but this is easier to do if you do all your homework in step one do step one then step oh this is evolutionary all right now because right, this is th this is key when you go to look at the list if you've got a common name like johann schmidt um, or, or heinrich schmidt, whatever you know a very common name if you don't have a rough time span of when they came over it's just a lot more difficult spinning your wheels and you're going to have terry and you're going to have to buy flowers so step three is determine which records are available so you take the list that you said and then you check those out is that what you're saying there uh, with step three we're looking at what passenger lists are available for oh. reports maybe even think about where your person might have emigrated from if the name is rare you don't maybe you can just do a search and maybe you'll be fortunate but the name is a little more common you'll want to say you know is there a chance they went through New Orleans instead of New York or Baltimore or, or one of the other ports? This is a list that I pulled off of Ancestry for what's in their New York City database. Um, I would only search a specific city if you've got good, reliable knowledge that that was the port they uh, emigrated through. Like maybe the Declaration of Intent states it specifically, or there's some other document that states it specifically grandma felt like they came through new orleans is not <laughs> i realize you may think a lot of grandma but you know unless she was there on the boat with them she's getting it second or or third hand perhaps and, and, and she she got run over by a reindeer anyway so <laughs> <laughs> and also while we're talking about which records are available is understand that it may not just be the u.s our passenger arrival lists that you're that you're going to want to look at. Uh, the second leading exit port from Europe in the 19th century was Hamburg, Germany. Uh, obviously for Germans, but also for many people from uh, from Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, and those those records. Uh, have been reserved, preserved from 1851, and we have some slides on that that uh, that I can run through, uh, talking about a, a particular uh, emigrant named uh, Rosina Weibel, uh, and uh, and we do uh, find her on indeed coming into uh, to New York on the passenger arrival list. And you're getting these up here, aren't you, Shamel? Oh, yeah, why, oh, yeah. While Shamel, while Shamel right. is pulling that up, I would like to mention, Jim mentioned <laughs> other ports. So, uh, my Irish people, for example, did not come through a U.S. port. They came through Canada and, in 1864, and then in the later 1860s, crossed the border and came down into the United States. So in some instances, they might have emigrated and not even come to the United States originally. Uh, Excellent point. Excellent That's point. Really cool. Yeah. So, so maybe the reason I didn't, um, are we ready for that step? Yeah. You, okay. Yeah. Are we ready to show your slides now? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I, th I thought you could just do it in at least five languages for me. 
<laughs> maybe six, maybe six. So, um, yeah. So here's so here's the uh, the passenger arrival list coming into New York, arriving in March of 1857. She's 29. The ship is the uh, Harmonia, uh, and um, that's pretty much all it says. If we advance to this one, it just gives you a close up of that information. Uh, and that's you know that's all that's all well and good, but because she went uh, left through the port of Hamburg, uh, we then can go to the next slide and see that she is also on this Hamburg embarkation list, uh, and left uh, in February. So you can see it took a, took about a month uh, the the travel in in 1857. Uh, and here we get the bonus information that she is from Nuremberg, Bern, which in English we would call Nuremberg, Bavaria. Uh, so that's still a, that's still a large city. So it's, it's always nicer when they lo locate a, a small village. Uh, but this did did make her findable. I did this was when I was doing client research, and I did find find her uh, her baptismal record. Oh, uh, and then also want to note that not only does Ancestry have uh, searchable the Hamburg embarkation lists, there are also handwritten lists, uh, handwritten indexes uh, that were compiled by the Germans uh, more or less contemporaneously. Oh, uh, and since now this handwriting is not too bad, actually, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of sloppy handwriting in the actual uh, uh, Hamburg lists. So those indexes, if you at least know uh, a year or, or anything uh, closer than that, uh, that you can look them up in those handwritten indexes, which Ancestry also has online as a browsable file. Uh, so, so it's kind of a kind of a, uh, uh, a a backup a backup plan. If we advance, I think you'll see the uh, yeah. This is uh, gives uh, the um, title of the database and the fact that it's browsable. And then, if we advance to the to the final one with this one, uh, you get the the index entry, uh, which then can uh, be, can refer you to the page number in the actual lists if you haven't been able to find them uh, by uh, doing a database search in the lists. So a little complicated, but the, the, the upshot is these are additional records that uh, should be checked and uh, you, know, you, you shouldn't be giving up. So, well, I can't find, I can't find a, uh, her arriving in New York. No, then look for Hamburg, you find her in Hamburg then you might do a manual uh, search or uh, browse of the, the New York lists a month later. So. so it sounds like to me, you go, you, for a passenger list, you got to go beyond searching and you got to actually do some research, right? <laughs> yeah, well, true. You, you also want to remember that if they didn't come through Hamburg, you're just going to get, if you find them in a passenger list in the United States, it's going to say England or Ireland or maybe a German province. If it's a little bit later, you may get a, you may get a village, but for a lot of the ones in the 19th century, you're just, you're going to get the country and that's, that's going to be it. Yeah. Um, which is why well, you got to go do, it goes back to doing your homework because the there'll be other names in the manifest besides your person you can use to kind of clarify a little bit, perhaps. If it's your You're guy clustering your fan club. So right. are we ready for step four? Yes, we are. Creator um, research. What is this all about? Is this a plan? Is this a sexy research plan? Let's just call it a research plan. Um, pull up a couple of the. Uh, I'm trying to make sure we stay on our time here. Pull up the uh, the charts that I should be part of the uh, the handout presentation. Um, when you've done your research, I like to make up a chart before I'm going to start searching for these people in these in these databases and making these queries for names, so that I don't overlook anybody any possible name combinations and i'm aware of all of what i'm searching so the last name here was kavitzel the correct spelling is the is the first spelling 
one of the things on a lot of these sites that we do is we'll we want to use a we'll use a sound deck search or a sound based search and so for this name and the, some of the main variants of how it's spelled i got what's called the sound decks code now you don't use the sound decks code you don't type that in the box but <laughs> what this tells me is if i spell it the right way it'll that's c240 if i spell it the second way with a v instead of a w because of how the german pronunciation of this name it sometimes gets spelled that way then those net the ones with c1 a search for kavitzel c-a-v will catch C-O-V because they have the sound X, same sound X code. Mm. It will also catch that last one down there, C-U-H-V-I-T, because that also has C-132. But if I think it could be cut with a K, I'm going to have to do that search separately. So I want right. to think about that because if I type it in the right way and think, well, I'll do it. Then I'll type it that way and I'll put a sound text code and that's going to catch them all. It's not. It's <laughs> yeah. not. The only one it's going to catch is the top one. It's not going to catch those four variants underneath. There may be some that it does catch, but it's, it's not going to catch those. So four. you're trying to say we can't just toss the sound decks out. It still has merit in it our still life. Has merit. You just like a lot of other things. You just got to know how to use it. You could also use wild cards, but some names wild cards work. There's so blasted many ways this could be spelled that wild cards sometimes aren't quite as effective. As it, they could you know, be as, as, this, they, as, yeah. as with some other names. It just kind of depends on the name, but you want to know what you're going to catch. Then I like this is a problem solving chart for the two, uh, the two immigrants, Anton and Mary. Actually, Anton Christian and his wife, Marie, made a name unknown. I took the census <laughs> records. I, I didn't have a good birth date for them at the time I was looking for them. These were the census records they were in because of when they had the wisdom to die. And so these were the <laughs> ages and the years of birth. So for Anton, I had 1821 to 1830 as his range of birth years from the census. And Mary, I had her. She was consistent. Bless her heart. Her age was was a little more consistent. So I had 1829 uh, as a birth year for her. But I want those details when I'm searching those passenger lists. This last name isn't very common, so I might be able to get by without putting an age. But if the last name was more common, I'm going to have to put an age yes. or something in there. I'm yes. also going to have to maybe put a birthplace as well if the name is more common. These people are a real challenge because the name is Germanic, but they were Swiss. And because of where they lived and some of the migration, sometimes they say they're born in Germany, sometimes they say Italy, and sometimes they say uh, Switzerland. So I've got to think of all those variations on the on the birthplace. But a chart is helpful. Uh, These was are there one great more chart? charts. Was there one more chart in there? I think you had two charts. Okay. The other thing I would do is make a chart of the name combinations. He's Anton mm -hmm. Christian. He could be Anton or he could be Christian. Okay. Um, and then bear a chart with the variation in the last name as well. Um, okay. The first name I could get by A-N-T and an asterisk, if you're familiar with that, on his first name to catch those variants. Except Did you have time. any passenger list that you wanted to show? I think you have a manifest. There's, you have there's two. One real quick. Okay. Yeah, there's one Let's real show. quick. I think this is, is this Jim's or yours? Sorry. I'll move forward if it's Jim's. That's Jim's. Okay. This is one from the 1870 era. This guy was 16 when he emigrated by himself. Um, when I noticed, when I looked at it though, there was another 16 year old that also emigrated with him um, at the time. So I made a note of that. They uh, Later I learned they were from the same village and about 15 years later, they're living as neighbors in Illinois, but they were two wow. young kids oh. that emigrated um, uh, in 1870. Very cool. Let's finish off these steps. So you create a plan. You use create some of these charts that Michael created. I really love the sound decks to expand the catching more names. And then you have um, execute your plan and then um, review. So let's go through all the steps. I've, I, you guys are getting me closer to like wanting to look at these things. Search strategies for online passenger lists. Step one, research the immigrant in the area of settlement where you know they are. Step two, estimate the year of immigration. Michael gave a fantastic list of records to look at. Step three, determine which records are available. Step four, create a research um, plan, 
using what's known. Step five, execute and review. Thank you so much, guys. I will see you soon. Who's not figuring out how to get you out of here? Okay, there you go. Bye bye. All right, let's get ready for the next show. I am so excited to bring on our special guest. She is a member of my home genealogy group, the African-American Genealogy Group in Philadelphia. And you do not have to be in Philadelphia. They are still meeting virtually. So check them out. Very fun, enthusiastic group of people. And Joyce is just, let me just tell you when I first met Joyce. I don't know when I first met Joyce, but I've been around Joyce for a while. And Joyce came, Joyce came out to um, be a part of street genealogy. And that is when I learned all of these wonderful historic people that Joyce is related to. And so I'm going to bring her on here today and she's going to do a quick start and she's going to introduce you to one of her famous ancestors. So everyone welcome Joyce Mosley. Hello. Hi, Joyce, how are you? Doing well. Good. So nice to have you here today for my home genealogy group. I know AAGG is watching you, Joyce. They sent out the email, so I know they're here watching. They you. did. So, um, Joyce, we <laughs> asked the same question to all of our special guests. We are dying to know your one minute genealogy story. How did you get started and when did you know that you were hooked? Well, I got started because my grandmother asked me to document our family history. We passed on our oral history from generation to generation, but she wanted to make sure it didn't get lost. And so she asked me to document it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I did. And for the last 30 years, I have been documenting our family history. I wrote a book called Graham's Gift, where the grandmother decides it's time for her grandchildren to know their history. So my family history is documented as well in this book. Oh, that is beautiful, Joyce. That is absolutely beautiful. So today um, we all aspire to write these books, but yes, Joyce's book is available. Um, so Joyce, today you are going to do a quick start. And I'm really excited because you have some really deep um, family roots in Philadelphia. And so today I really am honored that you're going to share it with Quick Start. So let's get started with, let's see, what is your title? It's a really cool title. It's called Breaking a Revolutionary Bread. So what does that mean, Joyce, if you want to kind of tell us a little bit about what does that mean for you? So I can document back to 1732 when my enslaved Great, great, great grandfather Cyrus Bustle was born. He was the son of an enslaved woman and Samuel Bustle, um, who owned Cyrus and his mother. So um, Cyrus was one of the last enslaved people in my family. He was sold twice, learned to bake bread, purchased his freedom, baked bread for George Washington's troops in the Revolutionary War and actually delivered bread to Valley Forge. Wow, wow. I mean, that is just so much. And so you are gonna do this quick start to kind of walk us through a little bit about your journey on how you were able to, and congratulations. Like, I know I gave you a hug at Philly Cam <laughs> on getting into the DAR because you basically, um, you met your, your grandmom's challenge. I did. It took me um, three years to get in the DAR, but I, that's one of the premier groups. So I knew if they accepted my documentation, then who's going to challenge it? Exactly. Exactly. Especially nowadays, maybe back in the day, there might have been a little, but today everything's all tight and locked up. So right. congratulations on that. Um, I, I could just feel your grandma saying that's my girl right there. <laughs> <laughs> so Joyce, let's go ahead and get started with baking revolutionary bread. So step one, 
is to, you said, is to identify the Revolutionary War ancestor. So you already knew from family history that you had a Revolutionary War ancestor? I did. And my um, um, family members in the 1700s documented that. So there were two written mm -hmm. documents um, that um, indicated that Cyrus Bustle was commissioned to bake the bread at Burlington, New Jersey port. And that bread was owned, that flour, he was commissioned to, to bake bread from the flour. And that flour was part of the War Department's flour intended to um, feed the troops along the Eastern cor Corridor. Wow. So that's major. Okay. So Jewish, you already had like some stuff, but there's probably a lot of people out there who don't. So are you have any suggestions on how people might identify if they have one? Um, I did a lot of Google searches because Cyrus Busta was a um, pretty interesting guy and there was a lot of books written about him. But I also went to um, because he was in New Jersey and Philadelphia. I went to New Jersey and the Burlington Historic Society. I spent a lot of time at the Pennsylvania Historic Society. And also um, because he spent the later years of his life in Philadelphia, I was able to go to the library company in Philadelphia. Yes, to the get library information. <laughs> And also um, my family is one of the first families of Pennsylvania. So, um, they, they have extensive research places where you can go research. So um, it is doable. And this book might help. And you said they have a newer copy of this. I have the old version, right? Yes, there's a newer copy out. And they actually, the DAR actually has a project where they are um, going to get more information about the forgotten patriots. Oh, fantastic. And so, okay. So, okay. So you identify either through a family story or by looking at the, I think the DAR actually has a site where you could search for people, correct? They do. They do. Okay. So that's step one, identify them. And then step two is to study the history of the period, put them in historical context. So what are some ways that you were able to do that, Joyce? Well, because my family was in New Jersey, it was it was not as difficult as some of my friends who um, have patriots or ancestors in the South. One of the things I was able to do was find the will of Samuel Bustle Cyrus's father. And in that will, he, he named the Negro, as they were called in the document, um, members of his household. So Cyrus and his mother, were listed in, in the um, will. Were there any books or any um, places that you went to learn about what their lives might've been like or what the time period was like outside of the genealogical records? Um, at, at that point. Um, or even now, like what, like okay. since, you, since you know stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the Burlington, New Jersey Genealogical Society was very helpful um, because they have records going back to the 16, 1700s, um, their colonial records. So I was able to get information from there. And because Cyrus Bustle owned a business, he, he owned a bakery, there was tax records, there were um, purchase records of land Okay, so that's the that's the genealogical aspects, which I think might be the so proving the lineage to the patriot is step three, and so um, you said you use tax records and I have a book of marriage certificates, death certificates, obituaries, okay. um, birth certificates. I have copies of pages of the family Bible that have um, births and deaths listed. Um, so going, taking the time to go through all of that um, will get you a treasure trove of information. To take you back in time, most definitely. So let us look at some of these records that you have. But first, we got to say hi to the lady who got this all started. Let's see if I could do that. <laughs> That's my grandmother. Yes. So this is the woman who got you started on this wonderful journey. 
It is, um, she was very proud of her lineage, her family history, and it was important to her to pass that on. So as it is to me, I'm now looking for a member of my family um, younger than me that can take over when I can't do it anymore. Nice. So this is, is this, was this one of the DEF certificates that were part of your packet? What was important about this? Yes. One? So this is actually Cyrus Bustle's daughter's DEF certificate. Um, it, one of the interesting things for me, um, most of my family lived in the seventh ward of Philadelphia, which is historically a black ward. And so I got her address off of this um, document that helped me find some more information because she wasn't the only one that lived in that area. Okay. And she was 92 when she died. So wow. she was living with her family. And um, it helped me get um, her grandchildren and great grandchildren from this document. Based off of the residents. Yes. Very nice. Oh, Lebanon. That's a, uh, yep. Lebanon cemetery. Very My cool. family owned that cemetery. Um, was that was, after Jacob C. White? Jacob C. White um, was part of my family. Oh, okay. How's he related? He's related to Bustle? Yes, he is. He's related to the Bustles. Um, Jacob C. White Sr. married Leah's daughter. Oh, okay. 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 Gotcha. All right. So, and this is a, oh, this is interesting. A letter to William Still from, and who's Joseph C. Bustle? Joseph C. Bustle is a grandson of Cyrus Bustle. He was in Harrisburg and ran the Underground Railroad from there. Interesting things about this particular one is that when William Still wrote his book, he had a code between his agents in the field and he in Philadelphia. They talked about um, having delivered three large hams and two small hams, um, <laughs> which were three adults and two children <laughs> on the Reading Road. <laughs> wow. They had created this um, code to be able to move people from point A to point B. Oh, I love that. That is amazing. So he was an agent living in Harrisburg. Living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, as He was a teacher but he also um, was the one responsible for moving the um, runaways, the freedom seekers, either to Philadelphia or going north. Oh, yep. School teacher, 10 years at Harrisburg. It says he was a descendant of Indian Quakers. Yes. Well, Cyrus Buster was raised as a Quaker and... Um, Cyrus Bustle's wife, Elizabeth Moray's mother was an is native was Native American. Okay, okay. This is one of the documents that I was able to use to prove that Cyrus Bustle baked bread for the troops. And this document is part of the collection at Howard University. There's nothing better than the Moreland Spring Garn. Oh my goodness. So this, he's certifying that he actually baked the bread for the troops. Yes. I love the handwriting. This is amazing. It, yeah. Sometimes it's really hard to read handwriting, but this was great. No, that's a, that's like a joy to read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then. Uh, and, what was and then this certifies that Cyrus Bustle was employed to bake the flour used at the port of Burlington. And that flour was part of the quartermaster department and they supplied supplies to the soldiers. And so this was my other document to prove that to, to the DAR that I could prove my lineage back to Cyrus. Okay, fantastic. Oh my gosh. And so tell us about what, what, you know, this went up, but it's something uh, going on with it now. Yes. So um, Pennsylvania. So first of all, these are supposed to be permanent, right? And what are you yes. talking about? It was knocked down, Joyce. That's right. A truck backed into it. So it's no longer standing. And I'm working with the Pennsylvania Historic Commission to get the sign replaced and back up. 
it gives just a kind of a brief history of Cyrus Bustle, um, that his father was an English lawyer in Burlington, New Jersey. Um, his wife's mother was Native American. And um, after moving from New Jersey to Philadelphia after the Revolutionary War, he um, started a bakery and he also was responsible for, for the founding of the Free African Society. What was the Which, Free African Society about? Um, their purpose was to help runaways, it, um, freedom seekers. Their purpose was to help the um, people that came to Philadelphia. Philadelphia had the largest population of people of African descent. So it was kind of easy for new arrivals to blend in. And mm -hmm. they raised money and the Free African Society raised money to wow. help the um, new arrivals, the formerly enslaved people that ended up in Philadelphia. Wow, I need to dig into them a little more. So I think you have something else here. Okay, so I was um, mentioning earlier about wills. Wills are a great thing um, to use. This particular abstract of the will lists the Negroes that are in the household also lists where the property is going for Samuel Bustle. So um, it was invaluable. It lists his children, his wife, um, and they were the half sisters of Cyrus Bustle. They had the same father. Mm. And so that was, that allowed me to even be able to dig down further and find out um, what was, what happened with his sisters. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. So would his, would his sisters also, their descendants be able to be in the DAR? Or no, because they're not directs. Um, they probably would be in the DAR. Well, his white sisters would probably be in the DAR. Um, cause somebody in, in that part of the family served. Okay. Um, and his sisters of color, any descendants that they have, and I haven't been able to find any, but they would also, um, if they've got the, they would not be because Cyrus Bustle's um, direct lineage is, doesn't include them. Got you, directly. got you. So you have another document. This one um, has script. This is one of my prized possessions. This document was written in 1790 by Cyrus Bustle. You can see a signature mm. at the bottom of the page. Um, I found this document in the New York Historic Society. And Cyrus was writing to his brother-in-law, his sister's husband, that because he owned Cyrus's mother. Cyrus's mother was never free, although Cyrus oh. was free in 1769. And all of his children were free because he married a woman that was free. So when Cyrus's mother was older and was ill, he wrote to her owner to, to say, first of all, he'd take care of her. And second of all, that um, in this particular letter, she was failing and if he wanted to see her before she oh. comes, she'd come soon. Oh wow. Oh wow. That's so sad. It is, but th th it's a fine. I mean Yes, it's a huge fine. Oh my goodness. How many times do you find um an African American that writes a letter in 1791? He actually dated that letter. That's amazing, Joyce. That is absolutely amazing. I think you have some um, maybe historical, oh, you found some um, articles about them. Yes. Um, and, and interestingly enough, though, this, this article is not accurate. <laughs> Aren't they usually not? <laughs> it is not accurate because they, they relied on Paul Robeson's wife's history of the Bustle family instead of really documenting because Cyrus Bustle, they, they skipped 30 years of his, of his life. Okay. In this particular article. Um, 
because they don't talk about the first man. They talk very little, I should say, about the first man that owned Cyrus after his grandfather died. Because they didn't care, right? That's why they need us genealogists to help fill in those, those, exactly. those areas. No, that, that's amazing. Um, yeah, that's why, like, every time I read stuff about the, the towns that I research and the people, I just want to just, ah! mm -hmm. but yeah, you're here to correct the record. So thank you for doing that. So um, you had to prove your lineage. You said you took it took you three years of you know back and forth being able to do that. What were the biggest challenges for you to do that? They accepted all my documentation, except I added that Cyrus Postal baked bread for the troops at Valley Forge and took bread there. Well, that wasn't included in their documentation, and it took me three years to get somebody to realize that. If he was commissioned to bake the bread for the troops in Burlington, how is he going to get the bread from Burlington to Valley Forge if he didn't take it? So, and um, all of the documentation kind of just stopped that he was baking bread, but he was baking it for somebody. Right. And <laughs> the flour was owned by the War Department. So I finally got somebody to say, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. It was a dumb moment. <laughs> they gave him the flour to cook for his family. They gave him flour yeah. to cook for the neighborhood. They gave, you know, for yeah. the troops. Okay. <laughs> so it was just really some back and forth is what took the time there. Pretty much. Pretty All much right. back and forth. And um, I have now two cousins that are also in the DAR. All because of your work, right? Yes, I did all the hard stuff. So we have another document. I'm not sure. I didn't know where to focus in on this document. Did you want to tell us about it? So the, that essentially is um, the, the document that says he um, baked bread. You can see the date on it. And yeah, so that's what I... We, just talked about. Ah, employee of baking bread flour at the post of Burlington. Right. Has behaved himself as a faithful, honest man and has given general satisfaction. Very, Very flowery language they talked back then. Yes. Yeah. I love their language back then. And there's two other documents. One is the document that shows that Cyrus... Bustle and um, Elizabeth Moray were married at St. Peter's Church in Philadelphia. Ah, uh, okay. And the third one is the one from the agent for for the flower at um, Port of, of um, Burlington. Okay. Oh, I love this writing. It's just so beautiful. The Church of St. Peter. So you got that in a church record, of course. Yes. Where did you get the um, ones for about the troops? So in 1827, one of my cousins actually traveled from Philadelphia to Burlington and uh, was able to get these two documents. Where did, but, but, like what kind of, what collection were they in? Do they weren't, remember? they actually... Um, weren't in a collection because they actually certified for her who was writing a, a biography about her grandfather that um, they had worked with Cyrus Bustle at the port. So it says, I certify that Cyrus Bustle was okay. employee in, in the making of, of the flower at the, okay. So it's this Thomas Falconer's papers? Yes. Okay. And they were at, the, you said, at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania? Um, these were in um, the Bustle Collection. Oh, okay. They were already a part of his, yeah. his okay. Oh, that's so cool. Let's look at step four, because I'm going to get carried away and it's going to be time over. Prove the Revolutionary War Service. And so that was, the, those were those letters with the, with the bread and the one earlier, the Thomas Ives, that you got from Moreland Springgarn. Correct. And so then step five is to, oh, is to document and submit to the DAR. 
So Joyce, do you have any tips for people who are planning on submitting to the DAR? Be patient, document everything, make sure that um, you, you make clear lines generation after generation um, and document the fact that you've got marriage certificates, death certificates, obituaries. I mean, all of that documentation that you need um, is what will make you successful in joining the DAR. Did you get and did you a lot of people where they have like progen groups and stuff? Did you do that or does the DAR do the GAR chapters? Are they a support or was it really just you knuckling down and being in AAGG and doing your work? Um, each branch, each chapter of DAR has a genealogist in the branch to help anybody coming in um, to submit their paperwork. So they look over it find the holes the um, where you need to beef it up some, and then they will go over it and pass it on to DC. And they have um, genealogists in the headquarters office that review as well. Fantastic. Let's go over the steps, Joyce. Amazing. Thank you. Let's talk about how breaking revolutionary bread the story of Cyrus Bustle, Jace, Joyce's ancestor. Step one, identify a Revolutionary War ancestor. Step two, study the history of the period. Step three, prove lineage to, uh, to a patriot. Step four, prove Revolutionary War service. Step five is then to document and submit to the DAR. Um, and everyone should be like Joyce, write a book, write a book about our family history. And she wrote Graham's Gift. And one of the things I want to add as well is that a number of the daughters of the Daughters of the Revolution that, that are of color are in because of a, a white ancestor. Uh -huh. So they can trace back to a white European person who... Um, was in their direct line that fathered maybe uh, a child by an enslaved woman and they are under their patriot is, is a European. So double unique, like even more so unique. So Grace, Joyce, that's amazing. Let's um, bring on Jim and Michael for our question of the day. I forget what it was. Do we actually have a question of the day or are we just... Um, saying goodbye. Do you have a question of the day? <laughs> As we look at each other blankly. We are. We're just looking more blank than usual. Um, I I have a question. Okay. Your favorite military ancestor and why? And you have like 15 seconds. Mine is Amos Mockmer, my great, great, great grandfather, Civil War. I believe he might have been at Appomattox for the surrender. Ooh. Top that, Michael. <laughs> um, I have an in-law who um, enlisted in an older man's re called the Greybeard Regiment in the Civil War. He was in his mid-40s, and all they did was guard bridges because, according to one of the generals, they were drunk half the time. <laughs> not as good as your story but it's it's, it's colorful <laughs> well mine i don't have any but i've adopted the 150 civil war soldiers and sailors buried in lawnside and of course you know my favorite is the medal of honor winner john henry lawson and what was great about him is that when he found out that he won the medal of honor and he was on um uh, the battle he was at the battle of mobile bay and when they told him, he thought his friends were, jo were joking with him. So he had to contact Washington to make sure that it was he was just a humble man. And so That's he great. was my favorite. And we know who Joyce's favorite is, Cyrus Bustle. Sure and is. so I want to thank you guys all for being here. Quick starters, go find your patriots, go find your immigrants. Thank you for being here.